Oh, hi everyone and welcome. And thank you for joining us at our 2020 Landscape in Focus Series FBAA eSummit Session Part 2 here in New South Wales and ACT. I'm Nick Wormwood, the New South Wales ACT State President of the FBAA. Um, given the current restrictions, we still wanted to be able to provide you with the, all of the industry updates. Um, and since we can't run our PD summits face to face, we're bringing in digitally. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, just some um, uh, some housekeeping. We've got uh, one CPD hour allocated to each summit session here in New South Wales. So you'll be receiving an email with the CBD code following the webinar. So please tune in all the way through because you'll be receiving that at the end. Um, before I get started, I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to our sponsors for all of their support, as without them, it would not be possible. You'll be hearing from them during the session, so please don't hesitate to get in contact with them. All of our sponsors, Contact details are in the attached uh, in the attached PDF, which is on the handout tab, the control panel for the GoToWebinar on the right hand side, and you can just download that there. FBAA members also receive a 10% discount off their membership every time a new member who is referred joins the FBAA. So. Uh, get out there, tell your mates um, that are with any of the other um, uh, any of the other organisations, uh, industry associations, um, bring them over to the FBAA. Also, uh, you can download our FBAA app to easily access information on upcoming webinars to register for. And a reminder to FBAA members to also continue to access the members area of the FBAA website. There's a lot of stuff on there, huge amount of resources and tools to assist you. Um, we use this in our business, very, very useful tools on there. That's the FBAA members area on the website. Um, FBAA has also launched a broker support program available to anyone to access via the website. Here you will find many of the uh, measures to assist you through the COVID-19 period and beyond. Um, please be advised that the agenda for today's session is also attached as a PDF on the little go to webinar control panel on the right hand side. Um, once again, in the little download section, you can grab that and follow through. So um, please, for, we, for our first, um, uh, our first speaker today, please would love to welcome Shelley Simpson from ALI Group presenting on my protection plan, good for clients, good for business. Hi Shelley, I'll let you uh, crack on with that. Okay, can you hear me now? I hope you all can hear me and I hope you can all see my screen. So just first of all, I just want to say thank you for um, taking time out of your business today to hear from me and to learn a little bit more about my protection plan. Uh, I know this is round two and I know that you guys have probably heard a lot uh, about ALI over the past 17 years, um, but it is good for clients and it is good for business and it has changed slightly. So it changed on the 22nd of June and I want to take you through what some of those changes mean. But ultimately, the, the situation remains the same. So it's still more important, probably now more so than ever, to start having a conversation with your customers about how they're going to protect their loan. So first of all, who is ALI? ALI is the leading provider of mortgage protection in Australia. As you can see on the screen, there's lots of statistics there. I guess just a couple of things I want to point out is that we have protected over 200,000 clients. Um, there's been a lot more than 200,000 loans done and a lot more than 200,000 loan applicants as well. There's probably double that given that the majority of uh, loan applications are joint. So you can see that there is still a huge opportunity for us to protect more Australians and we're going to rely heavily on you, the broker, to help us with that. So we've paid $67 million in total commission. So not only are you going to protect your customer, protect your business, but you also get paid for doing it. 
and we've paid a hundred. The, the main, the main reason we're in business is to pay claims. We've paid 114 million dollars out in claims, and that tells you that people really need to be protected. We had a net promoter score last year of 79.7, .7, so we're rated really highly, and particularly um, in the life insurance sector. So you know that if you deal with ALI, you're dealing with a reputable company that everybody loves. So just something to help you uh, get across the line, I guess, in, as to why you should be discussing loan protection or my protection plan with your customers. So ALI did a survey of 1,200 mortgage broking customers. 99% of those surveyed said that they expected their broker to discuss the risks of their future financial situation and ability to service their loan. If you're not discussing how a customer is going to meet their loan repayments, if the unforeseen happens, you're not meeting your client's expectations. So be confident that when this is something that your customers want to talk to you about, for those who had been through the loan process, so the 1,200 customers that had been through the loan process, only 35% could recall their broker or lender discussing this type of protection with them. And of the 35%, 88% confused it with lender's mortgage insurance. So they thought they were having a discussion. They thought lender's mortgage insurance was protection for them. So if it's only to educate your customers about the differences between lenders mortgage insurance and loan protection, then I guess that's a start. Um, but just know that when you're talking to your customers about it, they're expecting you to talk to them about it, and that by talking to them about it, you're meeting their expectations. So our mission at ALI is to protect Australian home and property buyers from financial hardship. We can't do that without brokers. We distribute our product through brokers, so we rely heavily on you to do that. Protecting home and property buyers from financial hardship is a pretty good mission, and it's a pretty good mission for you guys to be a part of. So what is my protection plan? So I mentioned to you that it had changed on the 22nd of June this year, our product changed, and this is our new product. And I think that this product probably appeals more to the borrower um, because of the inclusion of a third benefit, which is accidental injury benefit. So I'll just take you through quickly what the three main benefits of our policy are. So the first benefit is a death and terminal illness benefit. Most people have a life insurance or a death and terminal illness benefit in their super. The default amount of life insurance in super is $200,000. So given that the average loan amount is around $580,000 in New South Wales, Sydney, and there's already a gap of $380,000. Our average sum insured, our average death and terminal illness benefit is $300,000. And there's a whole host of reasons why 300,000 is the average, um, but it does relate directly to the average amount of life insurance in super. So there's already a gap. Okay, so make sure that you're discussing with your customers how they're gonna cover that gap. The next thing that we cover is a trauma benefit. It's cover for 13 serious medical conditions, cancer, heart attack, stroke, coronary artery bypass surgery, all those things that people worry about. They worry about their heart. They worry about um, cancer. Cancer is the main one, um, but heart disease is the biggest killer of women in Australia. So it's something that women really do need to consider. And how are you going to meet your loan repayments if you get sick? How are you personally, as a broker, going to meet your loan repayments if you get sick? Particularly if you need two incomes to service, or if you're single and there's no one else to help you. The third thing that we have is an accidental injury benefit. This accidental injury benefit is complementary for the life of the policy, and customers can claim or policyholders can claim on that benefit once every year. The benefit is three months benefit where they can't work for more than 30 days due to a disabling injury. It's 1% of the sum insured or a maximum of 2,500 per month for up to three months, and every year of the policy they can claim on that. So for example, if I am a labourer and I play touch footy on the weekend and I tear my ACL and I'm out of work for three months, I could have accidental injury benefit for three months whilst I'm out of work. If the following year I slip, I, you know, I'm doing some work around the house and I fall off a ladder, 
again, I've got an accidental injury benefit that I can claim on. So this benefit is really going to help your customers. How are they going to meet their loan repayments if they get sick, have an accident, and how are they going to, is their family going to cope if the worst happens and they're not there to help them with the loan repayments anyway? So it's a serious question. It's something you need to consider if you haven't already considered it. It's something you need to ask your customers so that they can consider as well. So ALI is filling an important gap in the market. We're filling the gap between the corporate super, which I mentioned the default life insurance cover of $200,000. There is no trauma benefit in super. You cannot get trauma in super. That changed in 2014. If there was trauma cover in super, it would, the benefit would be paid into the super fund and you wouldn't be able to access the, the benefit until you were 65 or until you access your super. People need another option and you're there to educate them on what that option is. And that option is either broker and loan or mortgage protection or it's a financial advisor. In a Zurich study, 30% of those surveyed said they're not willing to pay a fee for risk, which means they're not willing to go to a financial advisor and pay a fee. So that 30% that needs to be covered somehow and there's an option and that's my protection plan from ALI. Why is loan protection so important? And I hate to read off the slide, but this is so important because it doesn't discriminate. Illness doesn't discriminate. Misfortune doesn't discriminate. Anyone of any age can have an accident that can put them out of work. And in Australia, this is what an average year looks like. So the biggest one there, 138,700 people are diagnosed with cancer. And then I did say that um, heart disease was the second biggest killer, sorry, the first, the biggest killer of women in Australia. And 62,050 people have a heart attack. And finally, at the very end, I know you're not gonna remember all this, um, all these statistics, but even if you just remember this one, 474,500 people are hospitalized due to an industry injury every year and that's on average so again if you had an accident say we all have car insurance because we see ourselves having an accident what if that accident put you out of work how are you going to meet your loan repayments you might have some sick leave what if it's not enough and this slide also shows why it's really really important it shows if you have a look um, down the side on the left hand side, sorry, you've got the name of the um, policy holder who claimed, but then we've also got the age. We've got ages ranging from 22 right up to 69. We've got benefits for death and terminal illness um, and living benefits. Living benefit is the main benefit that's being paid out here. You can see the reason for the claim. The main reason here is heart attack. You can see the claim amounts. You can see that those claim amounts will be life-changing. They will have a life-changing impact. So you will be responsible for having a life-changing impact. If you talk to your customer about loan protection or my protection plan, they have a heart attack, for example, with Carl who is 48, you'll have a life-changing impact on their family. You can see the duration of the policy from two years right through to 13 years, and you can see the time to pay. The time to pay is really important. We've got Brent, who was 38, who was paid a living benefit for cancer of $86,000, had his policy for 12 years, it was paid out in two days. If you were to rely on super for say a death or terminal illness benefit, you would be waiting six to 12 months for a payment. You could lose your house in that time. So ALI's main benefit is that we pay you as soon as possible. We can pay, we can actually pay claims within one business day. It's on average about two weeks, but we can pay within one business day. And all of the benefits go towards the policyholder, obviously, but there is another benefit that goes towards the broker and it's called extra benefits. So if you're a policyholder or a broker with ALI, you can offset the cost of everyday purchases by using what we call our extra benefits program. The extra benefits program is a, allows policyholders and brokers to save between five and 30% on everyday purchases. That includes things like groceries, fuel, um, going to the movies and clothing and footwear. So for example, if I'm a customer and I spend $250 per week on groceries or $1,000 per week on groceries, instead of it costing me a thousand, sorry, $1,000 per month, 
So if it costs me $1,000 per month, it's only going to cost me $950 per month. That $50 can go towards the cost of my ALI premium. The average ALI premium is $50 per month. So therefore, I could be better off by having a policy and taking the extra benefits program. It might not cost me anything at all. It's a six hundred, uh, sorry, a one thousand five hundred forty-one dollar benefit to in commission, sorry, to a broker on average. That's the total lifetime value for a ten-minute conversation. The conversation is literally ten minutes. It is how are you going to meet your loan repayment if you get sick or have an accident? I want to talk to you about loan protection or my protection plan because that's solution. My protection plan is going to cost you about $55 per month on average. It's cheaper than your car insurance in some cases. And then you would do a quote. The quote takes about two minutes. It's all online, no signature, no paper. Everything's done online. All you need is the broken name, date of birth, smoking status, an email address, and you can email them a quote. So on average, we pay you $680 up front and $861 in future trial. We've got two commission options, a hybrid, which is an upfront and a trail, or just a trail. And you can choose, in the majority of um, aggregators, you can choose which option you choose, you take. The authorization process is simple, but it does take a little while to get through. You would submit an expression of interest on the ALI website, discuss your situation about your business with an ALI onboarding specialist, the reason why we do that is because it's not an accreditation, it is an authorization, which means you're authorized under our Australian Financial Services license. So we need to make sure that it suits your business and it suits the type of customer you're dealing with and that you, you're able to follow the authorization or compliance requirements. You'd complete an online application, which takes about 20 minutes. You'd complete an online training program or module, which takes about 20 minutes or 30 minutes. There's 30 minutes there, it's about 20 minutes. And complete an authorization session face-to-face -face with an ALI BDM by Zoom or face-to-face, -face, depending on what state you're in. And then after that, you're authorized. Once you're authorized, you have to meet certain compliance requirements in offering everybody doing a quote. So educating, informing, and confirming customers' decisions and showing us that you're doing that. And then once you're done, um, you're authorized. We also have double the complimentary period at the moment. So we offer 30 days cover free. We're offering up to 60 days cover free for a limited time from the 22nd of June to the 31st of August. Does anyone have any questions? Or do I have time for questions? Hi, Shelley. Hi, Nick. Uh, no, I don't think we do. We're, I think we're running a little bit no, short on don't. time, Shelley. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much for your presentation today. ALI does a great thing and um, yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic service. All right, um, guys, now we're going to see an important message from AAMC, IAA, Pepper and Suncorp on how they can help you during this time. conducted by our experienced industry trainers to make learning interactive and enjoyable. These classes are not webinars, so you have the opportunity to ask questions and discuss topics with our trainers and other students. Sessions are available for those seeking to complete their finance broking qualification. We are also running complimentary three hour recognition of prior learning classes to assist existing bankers and brokers to gain their qualification more seamlessly. Take the opportunity to upgrade to your diploma starting today. Register your interest via the virtual classroom banner found on our website. Hello everyone, this is uh, Darren Lowes from Insurance Advisor Net. Uh, just touching base with you all. I hope you're all keeping well through these uh, crazy times that we're all going through. Just a quick grab, uh, the one bit of advice I'd, I'd give you in the time that I've got is for those that have got their policies due this month, and I know there's quite a lot of you, uh, maybe this year's the year to take advantage of our premium funding option where you can space the payments 
out over 10 months rather than an upfront payment just to help you cash flow through these times. Any other problems at all, you guys know where to get us and uh, we're here to help you where we can. Stay well and we'll get through this together. Cheers. Hi, Aaron Milgram from Pepper Money. Here to say a huge thank you to FBAA members. Throughout these really trying times over the last couple of months, we've partnered together to make sure your customers are supported throughout. FBAA members have been critical to the success and growth of Pepper Money across Australia, and I wanna say thank you for that and wish you all the very best in 2020 and into 2021 together. These times are strange, like never before. So we're all doing our part. We're staying indoors. Our schools are different. The classrooms are quiet. But learning's still happening, if you know where to find it. We're quick to adapt. We're moving online. But we have to be careful to leave no one behind. To keep kids connected and moving ahead, we're giving them access to the internet. Suncorp is providing $1 million to the Smith family to support online learning at home. Visit thesmithfamily.com.au to learn more. That's the Suncorp spirit. Uh, look, thanks to the sponsors, AA, AAMC, IAA, Pepper and Suncorp. Reach out to these guys directly if you have any queries. Um, look, next, for the next session, I would like to welcome Peter White, who is the MD for the FBAA and will be presenting on where do you stand in 2020. Unfortunately, Pete did have an urgent appointment today. He's unable to attend in person, but we've pre-recorded a video for him to provide. So we can uh, watch that now. Welcome to the 2020 Landscape and Focus series. Um, I guess to start with, uh, there's a little saying by Woodrow Wilson that says, the only use of an obstacle is to be overcome. And uh, we've kind of had our fair share of obstacles over the last few years. And uh, our challenge is to constantly overcome them. And uh, yeah, in last year, we took on the Royal Commission and won that one. We we assisted fighting the unwinnable federal election, regardless of what side of politics you're on. Uh, it was certainly uh, good for our industry that the coalition stayed in power. And of course, we uh, took on the ABA with the financial abuse declarations that were never gonna work and um, turned them into confirmation. So that all uh, worked out nicely. But then of course, we hit the wonderful 2020 and we had bushfires, floods, volcanoes, blowing up islands off New Zealand earthquakes and of course COVID-19 where we land at the moment and uh, yeah that, that's created challenges for all of us but we've, we're getting through and it's great to hear and to, to see from uh, across the country that the vast majority of people are doing quite well very very busy um, we're just going to make sure it keeps running but of course with all these things we can't get complacent with them because there's a lot more work that's yet to be done thanks to this little beast the uh, recommendations of the Royal Commission so what I'm gonna do is uh, quickly touch on a few points through that and, uh, and then we'll jump into a few other conversations. Of course, uh, the one that's uh, heightened on the list and uh, uh, there's been an announcement today is the best interest duty. Uh, ASIC has released uh, late this morning the, uh, the final of the regulatory guide for best interest duty. And uh, we are currently going through that document uh, at this point in time, at this moment and uh, reviewing to see what's changed, what hasn't changed, have they taken up our recommendations, have they added things that we didn't know that were gonna happen, what does it all look like? So we're gonna give it a mighty shake and then uh, we'll send an advice around to our members on our findings from that, uh, and if need be, we'll respond back to ASIC. And we'll keep punching forward because uh, we have a few things that we're building in the background ready for this document to come out, and now that it's here, we'll once we've finished uh, knocking it about, we'll be asked to then uh, start a lot of this, is a whole lot of social media content, which largely revolves around um, you know, the compliance of a best interest duty where you, the broker, does comply to best interest duty, but no, your banks don't. Uh, they're not obligated to comply to this duty. Uh, it's a, a broker 
uh, imposed piece of regulation. And I know we all do this. We, we all put the client's interest first, but this puts a piece of uh, regulation around it. So when you're speaking to the client, you can say, look, not only do we do this, this is because of who we are, but we have further regulations that insist and ensures that we put your interest ahead of ours. We do that, but your bank doesn't. That's why you deal with me. And I see this as a big, big plus for our industry as we go forward in the coming years. So we're building a whole lot of social media content that'll be yours to use free, as well as a, what we call a 101 best practice guide for implementation of a best interest duty in your business. <clears throat> now, if somebody can come up with a shorter and easier title for that, I'd be really appreciative of it. So yeah, we'll call it 101 best practice guide, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, that will headline for you what your compliance obligations look like. And it will talk about what the law is, what ASIC's uh, views are, and how that, that at a high level will implement in your particular business. Your aggregator is the one, or your ACL is the one that will give you the documentation to complete and fulfill their obligations that they need you to do. But we'll put together that piece over the top and say, this is what the intent of the law is, this is where it's landed, and you need to ensure you cover all these particular things. And then your aggregator will give you the tools for that. So it's complementing what your aggregator will be doing or your, your ACL. And then come late August and we're we'll run into September, we'll be conducting an education series. And at this stage, it will need to be by webinar, uh, but we'll be conducting a, a series uh, around the country, which you'll get a, a certificate for once completed. And uh, it will cover obviously the best interest duty, but also how the interplay of RG209 responsible lending obligations, plus DDO, design and distribution obligations by a lender and the products they have, how these things all interplay in your ability to deliver on a best interest duty. So it's not just a duty on its own. Uh, well, that education series will bind all that together for you in a very simple manner, and uh, then we'll be well prepared for 1 January 2021 when this will formally start. And I know some of you are saying, well, we've already, probably, we've already started implementing yeah, well, best interest duty. Well, yep, and that's great, but um, we've also got to make sure that we haven't missed anything along the line from the RG as it's come out. So that needs to be uh, properly looked at and any adjustments or amendments made, which is why we've held off doing an education piece today, because we want to go out there, do it once and do it right, and, uh, and set you up for a, a win as we head off into 2021 and beyond. The other piece of that recommendation, 1.2, was on clawbacks. And uh, that was, uh, we were trying to have that changed. It's basically unchanged from what the recommendation is. We uh, argued it to the highest points in Canberra, including the PM. And uh, basically we're told it ain't changing and be lucky it isn't worse. Um, that's all well and good, but personally I don't accept that. I don't even come close. So anybody, if, any of you who've known me for a, a long period of time um, will know that my conversation has been going on for a long time is how against I am of clawbacks. And, uh, and and positioning that, if you do something wrong, if you commit fraud, you breach your agreement, then you own the clawback. It's like we all own uh, what we do. At, uh, if we do something wrong, we're going to have to own the, the, the penalties for doing that. But if you've done nothing wrong and a loan terminates early inside of a clawback period, you did your job day one. You you went to the market, you promoted your business, you, can, you uh, incurred expenses to run that business. Uh, to employ staff and pay phone bills, rent, whatever it is. But you had the expenses occurred to it, you got the client, you drove it through the uh, credit process and through to settlement, you did your job. And yet, you know, the whole thing with clawbacks is that you know, you're actually owed a much larger amount that you see from uh, upfront at settlement. You're actually owed a lot. It was just a mechanism that was put in place a long time ago to make it cash flow better and not impact interest rates that you get a portion today, which is called out front, and the rest of what you owed over time, which is called trial. So yeah, the reality is you only got half of what you're entitled to, and somebody's got their hand in your pocket for up to two years. Well, that's BS in my books. Um, I've always been against it. I will continue to be against it. And at the moment, I'm in discussions with an international research house to do a piece around this to create a whole lot of additional data beyond what we already have around this subject matter and to present it back to government and say, this is why you're wrong and why this needs to go, or to be refashioned into the model that, well, if you breach the law or, or your, your contractual obligations, whatever it is, then call back stays. But if you've done nothing wrong, needs to go. And then needs to be fashioned back in something that's more commercially fair. 
Yeah, you know, more on that as it evolves. And COVID-19 hasn't helped us progressing that, but it's still high on our radar. Uh, the other point, of course, was the three-year review on recommendation 1.4. That's now about two, two and a half years away as being uh, conducted by the ACCC and the Council of Financial Regulators. I would imagine it's high in their diary and they've probably even started some early work on it. But we have a commitment from within government saying that that emphasis has changed. So it's not being conducted with a view to, yes, we're going to change it to a customer pays model, fee for service, uh, rather uh, review it and do what regulators do. That's check to see if what's happening is okay. If it is, good, leave it alone. If it needs tweaking, tweak it. If it's buggered and we're doing the wrong thing and we're getting bad outcomes, we're going to own the nasty end of the stick we don't want to see. So it's upon us to act under that best interest duty and to do the right thing at all times by our clients. I know you do, but it's got to be said because we have a risk in two and a half years time as to how that recommendation will play out. But uh, we've at least been able to move the emphasis from a, the intent is to change the model to being, well, okay, let's check the model. If it's okay, leave it alone. If it needs tweaking, tweaking. If it's no good, we've got a problem. The other one is the alignment of regulatory frameworks and planners to act as mortgage brokers without any further consideration. We can't allow this to happen. It's what I call the duck syndrome. If it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. So if you want to look like a financial planner as a mortgage broker and align the frameworks and let planners to act as what we do without any other considerations, then you're starting to look like a duck. And what that means is under an FSRA arrangement, uh, knowing that we're under the NCCT, but if you're a financial planner sitting on FSRA, what happened to them? It's called FOTA, Freedom of Financial Advice. That means no commission. This is why we can't allow this to go full circle. You've always got to have a little give. So you allow a little bit to come together. We can never allow this because it will be the beginning of the end of the future of our industry. So we've got to keep those walls apart. And that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other recommendations around increased obligations for ACLs and broker reporting. They're all playing out in the industry at the moment in preparation. This hasn't come into legislation yet, but through the combined industry forum, there's some good work happening there around this piece uh, to create the transparency and uh, reporting obligations that need to be met with that. And then there's the recommendations of removal of the point of sale exemptions. That one's uh, been put uh, down the uh, list a little bit. I'm sure it will rise up to the floor not too far away. And we still have conflicted remuneration, which plays a bit part into the best interest duty. Unique identifiers, where basically it's an overlap across ACLs and ACRs as we have them today. And yes, it's another number, and it may even replace those. So it's still a long discussion to have on this. But the unique identifiers discussion is to impact all people who do any form of lending in Australia, including the bankers. <clears throat> so the first time you start doing any form of loans for a client, you get a, a unique identifier and that stays with you for life. So you may start working in a bank, leave a bank, start and become a broker, you still have the same identifier. So it's an identification number that codes for you. The other pieces around enforceable industry codes, like the FBAA's code of practice, um, they're looking to be enforceable uh, under ASIC's uh, um, approval, which uh, are things that we're looking at and working through at the moment. And the last little piece is, uh, we've uh, been very close to ASIC the last 18 months, two years with reverse mortgages, senior lending, all that sort of uh, transactional um, style of lending, which I know is a niche market, but it's been a very important place. We've seen elder abuse in this sector and so on. So we've worked uh, closely with ASIC. In actual fact, they used us for their stakeholder group <coughs> with uh, this piece. And uh, there's a piece of training that'll come off the back end of this, an education piece that will be uh, a requirement in the future that says if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, operate in that particular part of the marketplace, you would have had to have done this course. Excuse me a sec. <coughs> the other piece is, of course, the uh, meetings with government continue. And uh, interestingly enough, in this uh, electronic or digital environment of webinars and Zoom meetings, um, I know we're probably all getting a bit Zoomed out, webinar out, uh, the meetings with government. So there's more meetings now than what they normally are in a face-to-face -face environment. So our discussions with the coalition and the Labor Party uh, a, a, at a very high level. Uh, there's a lot of discussions, of course, around stimulus packages and what's happening in the economy and so on. But it keeps us in front of them as a visual face because we deal direct. And we are the only ones that deal direct with the coalition and the Labor Party without having other people between us. So it ensures that we keep our face squarely in front of them and they hear our conversations. And like I said, there's more meetings happening at the moment than what there normally is. So 
certainly keeping us on our toes. And all this falls around this little saying I've had for a long time, it's not about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. And obviously we're not talking about the weather, we're talking about the regulatory storm we're in. And that regulatory storm is always with us. You can see what was there in those previous slides and as soon as they disappear, there'll be something else come along. But we've got to learn to dance in the rain and that's why we do things the way we do, because I reckon we're pretty good at it. But um, of course, we, a part of that dancing is the rain, is a bit of a, and pardon the language, keeping the bastards honest sort of thing. We're out in the media regularly, uh, ensuring that we call out bad behaviours and, and things that are not set right in the marketplace. And uh, some of the recent conversations have been around the fixed, rat tra fixed rate trap. There's a tongue twister for an afternoon. Um, and that's not that fixed rates are bad, but it's important that people consult their broker to uh, make sure that their, their loan or interest rate structure is tailored for them. Because you know they may think, yeah, the fixed rates are really cheap, that's what I want. Well, it may not be in their best interest if in six months, 12 months time, they want to extend their loan to put in a pool. Um, or to do a renovation. Uh, they uh, may need something that's part fixed, part variable, or still all variable, depends on. But it's important that it gets reviewed professionally. And that was the key in that commentary to media. Uh, we looked at standardized, uh, standardization of documentation, application forms, privacy forms, discharge forms, the list goes on. In this day and age, we need to put our petty differences aside and just have a standard form for everything. Uh, and not one for this bank, one for that one, one for that lender, because they're principally all the same. It's uh, a matter of uh, just getting an agreement and doing it. Now, uh, that sounds easy, it ain't, and it's been going on for a long time, but it's high time it started, and I think we're getting closer to it. The other commentary was around delays in settlement, with discharges taking up to 14 days to be put together. And, uh, and then you've got the time to uh, actually then uh, book in the settlement time. Yeah, in my early banking days, and I've been in this game some 42 years now, um, I used to write these documents, well, sorry, not write, let me correct that. I used to type these documents on a typewriter, which virtually don't exist these days. And uh, we could turn discharge or settlement papers inside out within a matter of hours. And that was only delayed because of whatever was already in front of it in the pile. They took about 20 minutes to carefully type it up and it was ready to go. And then you just booked in settlement. These delays in the electronic world are just unacceptable and that must change. The other thing is delays in loan files being picked up. And this has had, been, had an impact through broker clubs. ASIC through report 516, when we did the review of remuneration, was very much against these broker clubs, but it got negotiated that if the measure was qualitative or predominantly qualitative, so basically 70% of the assessment, 70, 80% of the assessment, I think it is, um, then it was okay for broker clubs to continue on in that matter. But what we're seeing is that isn't playing out. What we're seeing is it's taking anywhere to 40 or 50 days for a lender or a bank to pick up a loan application to start processing and reviewing it. That's ridiculous. Yet, if you're on a broker club and the measures are volume based and I have the communications from our members outlining exactly what these clubs look like, it can take between one to eight days to pick up your file. Now, this has got nothing to do with a borrower and this has an impact on a best interest duty. Well, a broker acting under a best interest duty. Because if a client needs to settle a loan promptly, you can't wait 40 to 50 days for the process to truly begin, as far as the lender is concerned. It needs to be action. And uh, I, I don't see there's any reason why that all loans should be done under a, uh, you know, first in best So you go through the poll in a systematic order um, and priority shouldn't be given to one over another because the actual borrower is not the person at fault. Just because a broker doesn't meet a volume requirement to a specific lender, it could be because their product's been no good or their interest rates have been too high or their service levels have been too slow. Hint. Um, you know, that may not be in the best interest of the client. So these measures need to be carefully considered. And I think it's high time the banks change the dynamics of these things. Forget your broker clubs. Um, you may have special groups that meet because they're, they're high performers but nothing should impact the borrower from picking up a loan application and, and uh, promptly processing that particular application. So be in my bonnet about that, yeah, uh, but that needs to change because we're disadvantaging, disadvantaging um, borrowers uh, just because a particular broker doesn't give a lender enough volume. And ASIC's report 516, 
much, very, very much against the volume issue. But uh, of course, the dancing in the rain as we tackle the media, we also tackle various markets to, to protect what we do in the industry. So the IMBF that between myself and Canada we established a few years ago with six countries involved is all about protecting our industry because our regulators talk to the international markets to develop policy. So if we want to be in front of the conversations that our regulators are having, we need to be in front of the conversations that are happening overseas. So we meet on a monthly basis electronically. Uh, and next year, all things being well, towards the end of 2021, we're going to have an inter the world's first international uh, summit with the top 30 or 40 brokers from around the world gathering together. More on that as we get closer, but uh, keep that in mind and uh, we'll be uh, reaching out for expressions of interest of brokers who want to partake in that particular summit uh, when it comes around at the second half of next year. But again, Dancing in the rain conversations. It's why we're a part of the Small Business Association. We have around 19,500 brokers in our industry. There's certain other numbers that get touted around. Um, ASIC, uh, these are ASIC's numbers after we wash them against replications and uh, things that happens within databases. But, uh, and yes, that does include brokers that may be considered part time. But we look at things as to how does the law need to be dealt with and, and how it gets impacted. And this is the size of the marketplace the law needs to deal with, regardless of how, um, you know, whether they're part-time, full-time or whatever. And uh, as we get involved with the Small Business Association, so we ensure that any discussions that are happening around impacting a small business, because you're all small businesses, um, some of your micro businesses, you know where I'm at, um, that, uh, that you're protected as well. So it's just another angle, together with our ambassadorship for mental health, which we started in 2016, we, we do this because we actually care, and that's the bottom line. And uh, so we will continue that conversation and ensure that we're constantly talking about mental health. And I'll, I'll come back to another piece on that shortly, together with the foundation that my wife and I established, a charity called the Sanity Space Foundation, where we look after mental health, or we support the mental health and uh, provide groups and some financial or hardship relief for parents and carers, especially needs children. There's around 10,000 families across the whole financial services sector, not just breaking, but the whole sector, who have a special needs child in them. And they go through unique difficulties. And again, it's our part in doing something to support our industry, because this, that, that, that storm comes at different shapes and sizes for all of us. So we've got to make sure we can uh, help everyone that we possibly can. And I guess whilst all this stuff's going on in the background and creating distractions, we've always got to be focused on what our future is right, and where we're going. I can tell you now, I never planned to do what I do today. At the age of 16, I did my private pilot's license. I could fly a plane before I could drive a car. My dad used to take me out the airport for uh, the lessons when I was learning to fly. And my journey, I thought, was going to be a commercial pilot. That's what I'd planned to do. Um, yet, you know, that's not where I wound up. And interestingly enough, I don't see it as a job or a career what I do. This is my journey. This is the industry that I am significantly a part of for some 42 years. And it's important with your future that you look at it. It is your journey and your journey to travel. So make sure you focus on where that goes because the path isn't always straight. It can go about this way, it can go that way, or you think you're gonna do that, you wind up doing this, but follow that journey. It is important because it's your future. It's your journey. It's where your destiny will lie. And remember, no one said it would be easy, and I'll vouch for that one, but it is certainly worthwhile. So I want to talk a little bit now about our broker support program before we come to a, a close. And just let you know that uh, you know, we launched this at the beginning of the COVID to ensure that you understood we've got you back. Uh, normally each year in association world, we uh, review membership uh, fees uh, on an annual basis. We put a freeze on that. Our CFO, I think, was sort of looking forward to bumping fees up a little bit. We said, yeah, no, you're not. Um, and in actual fact, we're not going to look at them until after the next financial year. So it's not until after July 2021 we'll even think about having a look at fees. Whereas we know other people have put their fees up already. Well, we've not done that. We also added a payment program. So if you're having some cash flow difficulties at the time through COVID, no problems. We understand life's not perfect. Um, so we've got a small program there that you can pay off your membership fee over a period of time. Just reach out to us in complete confidence, strict confidence, 
uh, to our team and uh, they'll sort that out for you, too easy. We started a, a program called Call Your Broker Campaign. And uh, that's a series of communications that are free to you to use. They're off the homepage of our website that you can use to send out to your database and your clients. And they're all catchphrases that end up, well, what you need to do is call your broker. See, give us a ring and we'll help sort it out. So there's a whole host of free asset collateral that's sitting on our website off the homepage. It's, uh, you don't have to be on the members area, it's all there free for you. Um, go grab it. There are, um, there are social media images, tiles, whatever you want to call them. There are blogs that are free, videos that are free. There is a, uh, a specialized professional uh, program for generating leads. If you've got any problems in doing that and you want some further guidance that we've been given license to use, there's a whole swag of information there for you that you can uh, dive into free of charge. Just go get it. Uh, of course, the other thing we do, and, and there's another one on tomorrow, is a, a weekly question and answer session with me called Q&A with Whitey. Um, and if you haven't registered, um, do it. Get, get on there. It'll be 9.30 Western Australian time tomorrow. Um, Q&A with Whitey. Register, be a part of the conversation. We're having a chat tomorrow with a whole swag of alternative lenders you don't normally hear from. We're going to see what they're up to and find out what uh, things they can and can't do. So it's going to be a great conversation. It goes for about an hour, um, but uh, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Make sure you register. Uh, and also within our program, we uh, our Break Support Program, we've got a series of new educational opportunities. If you want to do some upskilling this time, there's a whole lot of things we've got there for you with discounts and so on that uh, will help you out. The other piece that we have within our BSP, the Break Support Program, are all the links you need for all the government stimuluses and things that are happening on a federal basis. So um, they're there for you to try and make it a, a quick and easy reference for you. So this is what the campaigns look like. You'll see imagery uh, looking like this or uh, more shorter ones here where we're putting it out to the marketplace. This one's the Q&A with Whitey. Look for that every Thursday, 11.30 AEST, 9.30 WA time. Register for tomorrow's conversation. It's going to be a beauty, actually. Uh, nice, casual, relaxed, relaxed atmosphere. And make sure you've got your cup of coffee and morning tea with you. It's an important part of what we do in that morning. It's not all formal and stuff shirt, let me tell you. Uh, we have great, fun conversations. And, uh, of course, I said to you before about that mental health conversation and that we are going to keep it going. Uh, we are there supporting Are You OK Day, and we're back with Beyond Blue. They're there to help you. We've had mental health workshops uh, going through COVID. We've got more coming, and of course, we've got Are You OK Day coming up as well. And we do this because things aren't good. And there was Mental Health Week uh, last week or the week before, and the facts aren't getting any better. And uh, apologies to the ladies. This is ladies. This is off the back of Men's Health Week, so these are men's data. But we are a 72% dominated industry, a male dominated industry, so it's a relevant conversation. But bottom line is that one in eight men will experience depression and one in five men will experience anxiety at some stage of their lives. These are the numbers and facts that are hot off the press right now that are happening to men. So yeah, when we've got a 72% male dominated industry, a lot of, the, a lot of our guys um, are suffering with challenges. And uh, we can also further see that on average, males make up six out of every eight suicides every single day in Australia. And there are eight suicides in Australia every day. Six of them are males. So this is important stuff. This is why I'm so emphatic on having this conversation around mental health. We need to make sure we look after one another. The FBAA takes that ambassadorship uh, position to keep the conversation alive. We have very supports with Are You OK Day Beyond Blue, what the Sandy Space does. But I'm also going to be launching, hopefully, in the coming uh, second half of this year, probably the beginning of the, uh, the last quarter, another initiative under our mental health, uh, mental health programs that we run. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm not going to tell you any more just now, otherwise you'll give the game away. You'll have to wait and see. But anyhow, make sure you're a part of that conversation. Make sure you look after your friends. Make sure you reach out. And make sure make people sure are okay. All you got to do is have a cup, cup of coffee and be a friend. That's all it's about. Anyway, that's pretty much it for me. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I know you can't hear us, but he's Peter White is always there. Um, uh, fighting for the industry. It does an amazing job. 
Um, all right, next up, we uh, just like to um, introduce an important message from a couple of our sponsors, uh, Bluestone, Strive Financial and Trailbook Loans and how they can help you during this time. Sarah is a florist. Khalil runs his own business consultancy. And Daniel and Rita own 15 coffee shops across the country. But when they applied for home loans, they were all rejected by the big banks. 58% of Bluestone's borrowers are self-employed. Unlike banks, we take the time to get to know our customers' unique circumstances and accept a variety of supporting documents when verifying income. So for your self-employed customers, turn to Bluestone. Bluestone.com.au G'day legends, hope you're living the dream slash nightmare in these uncertain times. Strive Financial coming to you live from isolation. Best thing about ISO? Dad's home more. Worst thing about ISO? Dad's home more. Listen here champ, you're not in charge yet. On a serious note guys, Strive Financial we're here to help. We got through the GFC by lending responsibly and maintaining our relationships with our brokers and our clients. And this time will be no different. Phil Joints once told me, in times of uncertainty, focus on controlling the controllables. Sounds pretty professional from you, Dad, considering you don't have pants on. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. And look after each other, and we'll all come through this together. All right, thanks to Bluestone Strive Financial and Trial Book Loans. Look, for any further information, you can contact them directly. Uh, look, next, we'd like to introduce the next speaker, um, who is Mariana Maroon from Credit Fix Solutions, who's presenting on credit reporting top tips for your business. So I'll just wait for Mariana to jump on. Hi, Mariana. Thanks, Nick. Hi. Right, I'll Thanks, leave Nick. you with it. Awesome. Hi, all. Thank you for participating. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Peter White and the team at FBAA for making this all possible. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Mariana Maroon, and I'm the New South Wales BDM for Credit Big Solutions. Um, and today I'm going to run through the complex arena of comprehensive credit reporting. So as many of you know, there were major changes made to credit reports in 2014 with the introduction of comprehensive credit reporting. So prior to 2014, there was only negative reporting. Um, so you'd see reports with inquiries and defaults. But now with the introduction of comprehensive credit reporting, um, not only do we see inquiries and defaults, but we see all liabilities and repayment history over a 24 month period. So before I continue, I'm going to disclose our disclaimer. So this presentation is for information purposes only. And for those seeking legal advice in regard to credit reporting, we do have a team of lawyers at Credit Fix Lawyers, and I'd be more than happy um, to pass on those information, that those details after um, the presentation. So I'm going to start with eight key ways um, we can help your business and how we can be an, a, a value add to your business. Um, then I'm going to run through four case studies or common scenarios that we come across at Credit Fix Solutions, um, as well as three credit reporting top tips. So eight ways we can help you. So the first key area where I believe um, a credit repair business can be an, a value add to your business is having a no result, no fee policy like ours. 
um, so you can refer to us with confidence and in saying that we do have a 95% success rate. So we do have one-on-one -on -one free expert consultations. So within that initial consultation with your client, we'll be able to gauge whether we're able to assist um, with their credit file matter. Um, or alternatively, you can always uh, flick us um, the scenario or the report um, and we can, we can pass on that information to you for whether we're able to help or not. Then you can relay that back to your clients. So fast and thorough investigations, hence our 95% success rate. No chasing required. So once your client is on board our service, we do provide weekly updates by email to yourself and your clients um, in regards to the status of their case and how close we are to removal. Um, but not only that, we do provide um, updates even after the initial consultation with your client. So increase your conversion rates. Um, so as a result, we're able to, to increase your conversion rates and get your client going, transitioning from a non-conforming lender to more of a mainstream lender. So we do offer a small referral fee, um, referral commission, sorry. And this is regardless of the end result um, of your client's case. So expand your hub of um, experts. So because this presentation entails a lot of information, um, it'll equip you uh, with the right sort of information when these credit reports come through or when these types of um, clients inquire. So this slide is very familiar to us all. So it's a copy of the Equifax report. And most of us, when we look at this, sorry, most of us, when we look at this, are looking at that top comprehensive score. So that's 441. Um, but beneath that entails a lot of vital information that sometimes we do tend to overlook. So underneath is the VITA score 1.1. And what a VITA score 1.1 is, is an algorithm that Equifax generates in the background um, to pre predict what the client score is going to look like in the next 12 months. Um, now, this is based on the client's conduct, could be the type of inquiries that they've made, um, if there's any defaults, if there's any late repayment history. Um, this could work for or against the client. And in this case, it's worked um, against the client as the score is lower than the top comprehensive score. So be very wary of this as some lenders can auto decline based on this score. Um, and on the left, you can see um, the negative score. So negative scoring is basically the score, um, what the score would look like prior to comprehensive credit reporting. So only when uh, negative reporting was in play. And as you can see, it's still the same score. So it's still 441. And here we've got headlines. And below that, um, we've got adverse on file, credit inquiries, accounts, defaults, and total limits, um, along with repayment history, if there's any court actions or insolvencies. Um, and this is, this shows you if that, like, well, told you if there's going to be any red flags on the report. Um, so yeah, that just prepares you for any red flags to come. So this screen shows you how a liability is listed. Um, so which lender, the type of liability, the credit limit, and when it was open. You can also cross-reference this with what the client has told you. And below this um, is an account over a 24 month period. And I'm going to quickly run through what the legends stand for. So as you can see, there are many numbers and this shows you how many months in arrears the account is in. Um, one is up to 29 days overdue, two is 30 to 59 days overdue, three is 60 to 89 days overdue, all the way up to X, which is 180 plus days overdue. And a lot of the times, if that is the case, it usually won't show the client score on the credit report. Um, you can also see the, these yellow lines um, or on the Equifax report, this is known as R and this just means non, not reported. So for whatever reason, the lender has not reported payment um, and this could be, you know, because the client has called up and maybe um, let the lender know that they're, they're unable to make payment. So this has no effect over the score, by the way. This is a common question we 
are asked, so what can and can't be fixed on the credit report. So we'll go through what we can fix first. So unfair defaults and core actions. Um, so this could be the client has applied for financial hardship or they've gone through financial hardship or they've received insufficient notice from the lender. So we can base default removals on that. Um, the same applies with incorrect repayment history. So if the client has let the lender know within that 15 day grace period that they're going to be late on a payment, um, the lender is not allowed to mark it as late, but instead they do have to mark it as R. So if they have marked it as late instead of R, we can amend this for the client. Duplicate inquiries. So this is a good um, topic to touch on because for the most part, we actually can't remove legitimate inquiries. Um, however, we can remove duplicate inquiries um, or fraudulent inquiries. So incorrect personal information. So a lot of well, you'd be surprised how many times clients come to us with a credit report and somebody else's credit history. Uh, this could be due to, you know, similar name and date of birth, uh, but we are able to amend this. And fraudulent applications. So what we can't amend is legitimate defaults and core actions, um, such as the lender following the correct protocol and procedure, um, which has resulted in the defaults. So we usually find this once we start investigating. Um, and core actions, if you do have a client that has a core action present on the report, I advise you let me know what the core action is first, as we do know that some core actions we are definitely unable to remove. Um, as I mentioned, we are unable to remove legitimate inquiries or repayment history, um, and we can't do anything about liquidation or um, part nine or part 10 bankruptcy. They're to remain on the report for five years. So with my next topic, I'm going to quickly run through four case studies to help you understand our service as a value add to your business. So we come across this a lot, um, especially from clients. So I've paid the debt, surely they must remove the default. Unfortunately, paying the debt does not remove the default. So even if the debt is paid, um, it just changes the status, the default status from outstanding to paid, but it is to remain on the report for a total of five years unless we find the default to be listed in error or we find legal grounds and that's how we can get it removed sooner. Um, but yes, unfortunately, um, paying the debt does not remove the default. So a smaller default is easier to remove than a larger default. So this notion is a myth. Um, reason being is because a lot of these smaller defaults are usually from utilities such as gas um, and water. And a common reason we get for why the default is there is because there's been a change of address and they haven't contacted the provider and let them know. Unfortunately, this isn't a legitimate reason to remove the default, um, as it is all our responsibility to let the provider know about updated details. Um, however, we still take these on board. Um, not to say that it's um, impossible, we've recently removed a $300 Origin Energy default. Um, but yeah, just to, just to sort of bring back that smaller defaults aren't easier to remove. So the debt is unpaid, the credit provider won't remove the default. So we can still remove outstanding defaults um, as well as paid defaults, but we never encourage a debt to be left unpaid. So as part of our service, not only do we help remove the outstanding default, but we can organize for the client to be put on a, ma a manageable payment plan with the provider to help pay that debt off. Um, otherwise, even if we just leave, if the client was to leave the default outstanding, um, and we remove it and they've made no co contact with the provider, the provider can actually relist the default for another five years. So here is an actual before and after shot um, of an Equifax report, somebody's credit report, um, in this case company report, after we've finished removing a default. So as you can see beforehand, the score was 522. 
Um, and there was one default present on this report. So we worked on it for six weeks um, and we were able to remove it as we found that it was listed in error. So their score went from 522 to 722 just from removing the one default. So it's jumped by 200 points. Um, and as you can see, that percentage of adverse listing on the credit file has dropped um, from 10% to 3%. So that's just an example there. Yeah, so thank you for your time today. That wraps up my presentation. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me at mariana at creditfixsolutions.com.au. As you can see, it says WA BDM, but it's New South Wales BDM. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Or if you'd like, um, we do have a free ebook on comprehensive credit reporting. Um, feel free to send me an email and I can shoot that through to you. Uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now. Thanks, thanks, thanks Mariana. Look, if, if we could send uh, the questions directly to Mariana, we need to we need to get cracking. Uh, thank you for that. That we've um, thank you. Credit Fix Solutions are an amazing service. So, um, yes. Uh, now we would like to we we're going to move on to an uh, important message from Lend and Prosper as how they can help you during this time. To our FAAA family, thank you. Thank you for your continued support over the last three or four months in what's been a super challenging time for us all. Not only have you stood beside each other and supported each other, but you've continued to remain industry leaders. You've inspired us to ensure that we continue to deliver improvements to our platform to make your life easier. Thanks again for your support. For decades, small businesses who are the backbone of the Australian economy uh, have been struggling to get access to finance. So what we've done is we've created our own proprietary technology that looks at finding ways for them to get access to funding that they otherwise couldn't before. Our CDE, our Credit Decision Engine, which we've built in-house here in Sydney, looks at over 450 data points in 15 seconds. There, we're able to lend them money in a really, really fast turnaround time. So traditionally within 24 hours, but I know of an example where we did it in 26 minutes. Thanks to Lend and Prosper. Look, if there's any inf uh, further information, just please contact Lend and Prosper direct. Um, next up, we have um, On Deck, and please welcome our next speaker, Robbie Fiddler from On Deck, who's presenting on helping SMEs overcome big challenges. All right, thanks, Robbie. Over to you. Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you are unaware who I am, uh, I'm Robbie Fiddler, I'm the National Channel Manager and Head of Broker for OnDeck. Um, I uh, thank you all for tuning in today. And uh, I know we're going a little bit over time at the moment, so uh, bear with me for a moment while I make this uh, jump up full screen. Not sure what's happening there, Nick, but uh, it's not jumping up to the right screen. So let's try that again. All right, there we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch on today um, some ways that um, you can help your small business clients uh, overcome some of the biggest challenges that they're facing at the moment. Um, 
I'll briefly touch on um, a little bit of the, the history of uh, banking in Australia. Um, you know, through the 1970s, banks really did rule supreme. And um, uh, it was through the 1980s where the finance and banking system was actually regulated. Um, in 1990, some of the branches began to close and brokers really emerged as, you know, a real force to be reckoned with within the space. Um, 2002, third party loan originations via brokers reached around 18%. And through 2020, fintech sentiment and SME client consideration, you know, is really now at an all time high. Um, brokers and fintechs have really come from hum humble beginnings. Um, and today we're really disrupting the way that small businesses um, actually uh, reach finance solutions. Um, On Deck as a group has now loaned over 13 billion to around 110 small business clients across the US, Canada and Australia. Um, you know, when you take into the account the current COVID-19 situation, um, you know, we're really now facing um, the biggest challenge uh, of all that small businesses have ever really faced. So, so SMEs um, and sort of their businesses' usual finance challenges, um, you know, recently we did uh, a research piece uh, through April 2020, um, which highlighted some of the challenges that your self employed and ABN holder clients are facing. Um, and this is irrespective of the current COVID 19. COVID-19 situation, um, but really it's forming part of their businesses as usual operations. The clients that you love uh, are being um, rejected by banks and in a lot of cases, not even um, by brokers. Um, you know, they're being knocked back for finance, turning to the wrong facilities and their businesses are suffering as a result of the time it takes for banks to come through. Um, through the study, one in four SME owners plan to seek additional finance in the future. A figure that rises to around 53% of uh, SMEs with six to 10 employees and 58% of those with 11 to 49 employees. 38% uh, of SMEs in operation less than five years have been knocked back for uh, finance through a bank. And one in two SMEs rejected by a bank have turned to family and friends uh, or even credit cards for funding instead. 27% of SMEs that have secured bank finance reported that their business was negatively impacted um, due to the amount of time it actually took for them to arrange funds. So if we look at COVID-19, um, and really it's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges of all that small businesses have faced, uh, eight in 10 SMEs have already been impacted by COVID-19 with four in 10 stating it's had a severe impact on their business. 92% of small business owners expect to be uh, further impacted over the coming months by COVID-19. And one in two SMEs say they've experienced loss of revenue as a result of COVID-19. Um, and in fact, 43% stated slowed business operations, 26% cited delay in stock delivery, and 20% highlighted actual increase in their physical cost base. 57% of small business owners say that access to cash flow will help their businesses be better prepared to weather the coming storm of no COVID-19. Quickly touching on a few of the things that um, your clients like to do with funds um, sought through fintech lenders, um, uh, hire staff, uh, invest in equipment, buy tools or machinery, run marketing campaigns and initiatives, uh, building a new website, and with that comes different integrations into different delivery type platforms that a lot of businesses are relying on at the moment. Um, if you're looking uh, within the food space, expand premises, update technology, purchase stock or inventory, uh, even investing in new distribution channels. We've seen some fun fantastic diversification stories over the last couple of months. And obviously now at the end of financial year just passed us, um, people looking to meet BAS or ATO obligations. Um, so there's a few things that we can do to help you reach your audience. Um, on deck provide, uh, utilize ready made marketing assets. Um, you can jump online um, and view some of the current resources that are available. Um, you can access a range of send ready EDMs um, and also our current product parameters. There's a couple of example EDMs there. Um, these templates have recently been updated and are COVID-19 appropriate or sympathetic 
Um, there's a great idiom in there, which is purely COVID-19 support messaging. So it's really a way that um, you can reach out to your small business clients. Uh, it's not about selling. It doesn't uh, offer any sort of sale or call to action, but it's just for your SME clients to have some useful tools, information to support them um, at a challenging time. And it's a great uh, opportunity for you to add value and keep your business front of mind as they navigate these crises. Um, they're all white labeled, so you can provide your logo um, and we can design them in the right colors to suit your overall brand strategy. We've also recently launched a COVID-19 resource hub, um, which again, you can access free of charge online there. Uh, it's got a range of insights that you can share with your clients around the current government funding options, um, some practical tips on managing their business through uncertain times. Um, some other resources from trusted partners and, uh, you know, different government bodies and a few really uh, fantastic inspiring stories that uh, other business owners have shared with us. So in summary, um, you know, there really is a large amount of small businesses out there, over 2 million in Australia, um, and each of them have their own individual struggles. Um, there's so many ways for you to help a small business with their finance challenges. Um, and improving your knowledge of small businesses and the world they operate in um, can really help you to become, uh, you know, a subject matter expert, but also help you stand out as a broker. Uh, fintech and non-bank lenders are constantly offering new solutions for small businesses, so it's really good that you stay in touch with those. Um, and look to partner with a small business lender that's really going to help you grow not only your own business, but help you nurture your small business client base during a pretty critical time. Um, that's it from me today. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. My contact details have been shared with you in the handouts. Um, or if you'd like to become accredited um, or even have some additional training, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks very much Thanks, for Robbie. taking to uh, to join us today, and um, I appreciate uh, you know everyone with the FBAA. It's uh, it's always a nice experience to be working with you guys. Thanks, Thanks Steve. mate. Yep, have a good one. All right. Um, okay. So uh, before we close off this first East Summit, uh, this uh, second East Summit. Um, We've just got a few notes to cover. Firstly, once again, thanks to our national sponsors for their time and support. And please download their contact details in the PDF um, handout tab and get in contact with them should you have any queries or questions. Secondly, you will all be receiving an email from the FBAA following the sessions with the CPD code and your CPD hours and a short survey, we really appreciate it if you all fill out that survey um, so we can uh, improve this, this service to you all. Um, thirdly, um, there's other webinar recordings on our FBAA YouTube channel that you can watch and grab CPD hours or register for upcoming webinars on the website, the FBAA website, which is linked in the page below and um and tune in for more all right well everybody that concludes us today so thank you all for joining and have a great day and um happy happy wednesday thank you